Hey, Slider Crusaders, America is the greatest country in the world. Thank you for being here. Vaccine passports. Can you think of a more horrific idea than that? So the premise is that the government, the federal government, will have some sort of ID system, like on your phone or something, that you need to show in order to go to concerts or get on airplanes, maybe even into restaurants. That's great. That's not Orwellian at all. That's not the, the, the a staple in every dystopian future novel ever. All right, first point. We know there's no such thing as solutions, only trade-offs. Thomas Sowell always talked about how this is a great distinction between progressives and conservatives. Progressives do not understand this. Progressives think that they can find and achieve utopia. They have their solutions, they're gonna make it happen, and consequences be darned. Conservatives understand there is no such thing as a solution, only a trade-off. And this is true all day long, every decision you make. What am I gonna eat for breakfast this morning? Well, I could have eggs and pancakes and sausage and bacon. That sounds delicious, but that's gonna take some time. Do I have time for that? and not as healthy as a bowl of oatmeal, which doesn't taste as good, but I'll feel better and it's quicker to make and I got stuff to do, blah, 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 blah. What do you do? Well, there's no solution. There's just trade-offs. We are constantly making these calculations in our head all day long. No such thing as solutions, only trade-offs. It's the same with risk. Life is full of risk and we are constantly calculating those risks. Driving a car is a risk, but you gotta get to work. Is it worth it? All right, there's a certain amount of risk in driving a car, but I gotta get to work, so you balance it out. We are acting with COVID right now. We are calculating the risk with COVID as if millions of people haven't already received the one of soon to be five vaccines in America. We're acting as if millions more don't now have natural immunity from having gotten COVID and recovered. And because we're not taking that into effect, we're not properly calculating our risk analysis. I'll put it like this, if, if you gotta get in your car today, right? there's a certain risk you're gonna get in an accident and die. So imagine if right before you got in your car today, I said, whoa, 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 do not drive. I have impending doom of you driving today. Impending doom. Don't do it, I'm scared you'll die. You have so much promise and so much potential in life. Don't do it, I'm scared. That's not, that would cause you to not have a proper risk analysis anymore, right? Because now you're like, oh, wait, what, huh? <laughs> We're still acting that way with COVID. Now, if I sounded dramatic there, this is the head of the CDC. I'm gonna pause here, I'm gonna lose the script, and I'm gonna reflect on the recurring feeling I have of impending doom. We have so much to look forward to, so much promise and potential of where we are and so much reason for hope. But right now I'm scared. My, sorry, I was just gonna, I thought that was a longer clip. I was gonna blow my nose. <laughs> Embarrassing. I thought there was like 10 more seconds. Uh, by the way, she didn't go off script. She kept reading the script as she said, I'm gonna go off script. I'm going to go off script. I have impending doom about what's happening here. Uh, lady, that's not helpful. That is feeling over facts. Why are you unloading your feelings on us, head of CDC? I'm not interested in feelings. I'm interested in facts. What she just did right there is emotional manipulation. You got your headlines. Well done. CDC director, impending doom about blah, 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 blah. You got your headlines. You got your attention. And for what? So you can keep everyone scared. Hmm. Why? 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 Why do you want to do that? Why? Why keep the mask mandates? As Biden said we need to do. Guys, we got that Biden clip? Slash, give me another chance to blow my nose. <laughs> I think we got it coming up here. We got it in a second here. Biden said we got to uh, keep our mask mandates, right? Why? Why do we have to keep our kids out of school? Why do we got to keep everyone scared? I think they need to keep everyone scared as long as they can until they can roll out the vaccine passport, which again is a stunningly horrific idea. <laughs> so again, it'd be like something on your phone that you need to show, and it says you're vaccinated, and you need to show it in order to get on an airplane or go different places. First, completely unnecessary, like medically unnecessary. COVID is a disease that once we reach herd immunity, and I'd argue we're already there, it barely spreads. And even if it does, most people don't get sick. 
Very few people need medical treatment. We have new drugs out. That one just passed the, um, or finished its uh, phase three trial, and it's getting ready for uh, FDA approval. Two days ago, it was just approved, uh, or just finished its phase three trial. That would make, that would completely el almost eliminate deaths from COVID. So it's medically unnecessary. We've never had vaccine passports for the flu or any other illness. There's no need for this. Thank goodness for the governor of Florida taking the lead on it. We always said we want to provide it for all, but mandate it for none. And that was something that while it was advised to take, particularly if you're vulnerable, we were not going to force you uh, to do it. So there, were, there was never under discussion any mandates to take vaccines. We will not have COVID vaccines mandated in Florida. The flip side of that though, with these vaccine passports is, uh, it's completely unacceptable for either the government or the private sector to impose upon you uh, the requirement that you show proof of vaccine to just simply be able to participate in normal society. Mm, thank goodness for DeSantis. Thank goodness for the governor of Texas, Abbott. Remember he got rid of the mask mandate? Do you remember that? Oh, everyone's going to die. Everyone's going to die because they got rid of their mask mandate in Texas. Here's uh, Governor Newsom of California. He said it's absolutely reckless getting rid of this mask, man. Absolutely reckless. Greg Popovich, he's the head coach of the Spurs. Uh, he said opening up was ridiculous and ignorant. CNN quoted an ICU nurse saying, I'm scared of what this is going to look like. Vanity Fair, Republican governors celebrate COVID anniversary with a bold plan to kill another 500,000 Americans. That's not dramatic at all. Dr. Fauci, it's just inexplicable why you'd want to pull back now. Beto called it a big mistake. Hard to escape the conclusion that this is also a cult of death. The governor is sacrificing the lives of her fellow Texans for political gain. Michael Ulsterholm, he was one of the, the main um, scaremongers in the beginning of all this. He said, we're walking into the mouth of the monster. We simply are. Here's Joe Biden. I hope everybody's realized by now these masks make a difference. And the last thing, the last thing we need is the Neanderthal thinking that in the meantime, everything's fine, take off your mask, forget it. It still matters. I know you all know that. I wish the heck some of our elected officials knew it. Neanderthal thinking. Uh, this guy, Eric Deigelfding, Feigelding, it's a big time hack about this. Uh, he says this decision of uh, Abbott in Texas wants to make him quote, vomit so bad. And the chairman of the Democratic Party in Texas says what Abbott is doing is extraordinarily dangerous. This will kill Texans. You get it? It's been three weeks now. What happened? Here's Governor Abbott. Uh, All-time lows for everything. <laughs> Cases, dad's whole thing, all-time lows. Now you say, well, hold on, Cider. On Sunday, there were 1,900 new cases in Texas. 1,900 new cases. Good. That's a good thing. I'm glad. I wish there were more. Remember, the whole point was to not overrun our hospital system, right? Well, they're nowhere near. No one's anywhere near overrunning hospital systems anymore. That's, that's long gone. So who's getting COVID? Vulnerable people and older people, they're vaccinated. My wife and I, we went out to a restaurant the other day uh, for a date night. It's a restaurant we go to all the time. It's right down the street. And uh, it was all old people. We've gone all through the COVID time, you know, whenever, whenever we're allowed. And uh, they've kind of broken the law and, and, and stayed open. Uh, and it was mostly all young people. Now it's all old people. Why? They're all vaccinated. So they're vaccinated. They're fine. They're not getting it. They're not spreading it. So all these cases are young people. They're fine. They get COVID. Most of them don't even know they have it. And then they're better. And then now they're immune. It's as good as a vaccine. You want more people to get COVID and get better. Yet, here's Joe Biden. I'm reiterating my call for every governor, mayor, and local leader to maintain and reinstate the mask mandate. Please, this is not politics. Reinstate the mandate if you let it down. Does that make sense what I just said there? Months ago, before the vaccine, if people were getting COVID, it was mostly 
older people or vulnerable people, or could have been older people and vulnerable people. Now, older people and vulnerable people have their vaccine, so it's fine. So the only people who are getting COVID now are younger, healthy people, and it's no big deal. It's not great, I don't, right? It's not like, oh, I can't wait to get COVID, but it's not worth shutting down the whole country and wearing masks and walking around with uh, uh, vaccine passports. And amazing, the same people who want vaccine passports think it is the end of the world if you require an ID to vote. The same people who want you to walk around with a vaccine passport to go to a restaurant or go to the movies think it's no problem as tens of thousands of people flood across the border without their passport, just a regular passport. But you need to carry around one in order to do just normal, basic, everyday things. People are okay with this. Stop living in the fear of what we thought COVID was. Yes, people are still going to get it. People get sick. People always get sick. In San Diego County yesterday from COVID, actually last like three days, we've had one death. One death. People are going, right? Like, but people die from the flu. All People die from things all the time. You can't make COVID or any illness down to zero. Why? Because conservatives understand there are no such thing as solutions, only trade-offs. And we need to reassess, reevaluate. Are the trade-offs that we're making, that we've been making for a year, still relevant today? And the answer is no. I got to run here, but let me do this quickly. We've said for a long, long time, I think of health as four different baskets. All right, so imagine four different baskets in front of you. One is emotional health. Another is spiritual. Then economic. And then physical. Now imagine you each have, everyone has 100 balls, right? And you got to put those 100 balls and distribute them into the baskets in ways that you think are best for you and your family, right? Uh, people on the left tend to put all their balls in the physical health basket and be darned with the emotional, spiritual, and economic health or lack thereof now because all your balls are in the physical health basket. But if you want to put most of yours in the physical health because you're older or have any other precondi preconditions or whatever, then that's fine. I'm healthy and younger, so I would put more of my balls in the spiritual health basket. I want churches to be open, which are still not in California. So we each need to come up with our own decisions here, right? Again, it's all trade-offs and balance. But it's also worth noting that these four baskets are underneath this bigger umbrella of freedom. And no illness is worth giving up our freedom, especially something as mild as COVID. And I say mild now that the vulnerable and old have, have vaccines. It's now mild. Because they start a vaccine passport now, what's next? There's nothing, there's nothing. Listen, we say this all the time, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program. So do you think six months from now, after uh, we have a vaccine passport and, and COVID's you know, it's entirely gone and everyone's vaccinated or whatever, you think the president's going to say, all right, everyone, no more need for this. Go ahead, put away the vaccine passports. You don't need it anymore. Not a chance. They will require for all sorts of things and require all sorts of mandates in order for you to do normal everyday activities. This is a bad precedent. It's DOA non-starter. You must be against this now and not allow this. Because once it starts, it's never going away. And it's not even medically necessary. People still acting like it's the plague, like one day <clears throat> and then you're dead two days later. We should be, as a country, we should be celebrating the end of COVID right now. And instead, we're debating this dystopian vaccine passport. It's insanity. The true story is we are not rats in a cage. Stop treating us like we are. Coming up next, I got latest with the George Floyd trial and how we must not look at this trial. Actually, I, should be, I want to be clear, it's not the George Floyd trial, it's the Derek Chauvin trial, excuse me. Uh, we'll talk about how not to look at this trial. Coming up next, spread the word. Crusaders. So the George Floyd murder trial, the Derek Chauvin trial, uh, started on Monday. 
And I want to be very clear about something before we start our coverage and as you're listening and interpreting uh, coverage that you hear on other places. It's really important to know and, and be reminded of the true story here. What is not up for question, what is not up for question at this trial is, is what happened on that day sad? Is what happened on that day bad or unfortunate or upsetting or tragic or what happened on that day makes me angry or what happened on that day reminds me of bad things that happened when I was younger or to a friend of mine. That's not what a criminal trial is. We must know that as we proceed. And anyone who does an analysis, a, a criminal analysis, criminal trial analysis, from that lens is deceiving you and trying to manipulate you. I mean, the, mo the most ridiculous example is Chelsea Handler. Uh, Chelsea Handler, the comedian or whatever, she said, oh, it's so pathetic that we have to have a trial to prove that Derek Chauvin killed George Floyd when there's video of him doing it. And you read that, you're like, yes, no more trials. <laughs> That's it, that's the ticket, no more trials. What I've seen is enough for me, guilty. But maybe this is even worse, actually. This is um, one of the anchors on ABC News, Lindsay Davis. Uh, ABC News, by the way, for whatever reason, by far the most watched news program in the country. And here's what she says about the trial. Definitely about race, and, and I don't have to tell you, David, that this case is so much bigger than what happened 10 months ago in the corner of 38th and Chicago in Minneapolis. On its face, Derek Chauvin is on trial for sure. But for many Americans, this nation is on trial. Our criminal justice system is on trial. And for many, especially black people, um, this is about black and white. This is about justice for people who aren't specifically involved in this case. This is about justice for Eric Gardner and uh, Breonna Taylor and Daniel Prude and on and on and on, the countless black people who have been killed by police in this country with very little repercussions or, or, or punishment. And I think that that's what makes it interesting when you look at the context, the backdrop of what also was happening in this country on May 25th of 2020 in New York City, Central Park. It's the same day that a white woman called the police on a black man who was bird watching and said, threatened that she was gonna call and followed through with that uh, to say that a, a black man is threatening my life. And so I think that you have one man's knee that has become representative of the analogous this symbol of the oppression of black people around the globe. Good night. Now, to be clear, she did not say at the end of that clip, and that is an incorrect way of looking at it. What a criminal trial really is, is blah, 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 blah. No, she didn't do that. The nation is on trial? What does that even mean? The nation's on trial. For what? Maybe China, maybe China should be on trial for flooding America with fentanyl, which George Floyd had three to four times the lethal limit amount in his body, lethal limit of in his body. She says it's about justice for, for every other case. Could you imagine that? Imagine if you're a police officer and you're doing your job, according to police protocol, by the way, the person you're apprehending dies from a drug overdose. Again, three to four times the amount of uh, lethal limit of fentanyl in a system. The person dies, you're on trial now for the death of Breonna Taylor? Or you're not even on trial for the death of Breonna Taylor. You're on trial for the anger that people have about the death of Breonna Taylor. The anger that people have that have no idea what they're talking about about the death of Breonna Taylor because so many people still think that the police got the wrong house. People don't even know what Breonna Taylor was actually doing so they have this anger based off of something that's not even real and they're putting on top of Derek Chauvin? That, like, could you imagine if you were in Derek Chauvin's shoes right here? You're accused of a crime, but you're not on trial. It's the justice system that's on trial. And you're just a sacrificial goat. She said it's about black and white. Black and white, what do you, no. One of the police officers, four police officers here, one of the police officers, Alexander King, is black. It was his third shift ever as a police officer. That, that by the way, that last name, K-E-U, and just pronounced King. It was his third shift ever as a police officer. 
Thomas Lane, another police officer, is white, but the fourth officer was Asian. So how's this black v. white? Officer King is actually a really fascinating story. He wanted to join the Minneapolis Police Department to help fix and improve the department from within. When he was younger, he saw a sibling, um, or a friend of his, I forget if it was a friend or a sibling, or a relative, uh, get mistreated by a police officer. And he saw people protesting different things related to the police. He's like, no, that's not the way to fix it. He wanted to reform the system from the inside. And his family and friends criticized him for joining the police department, but he said he wanted to be an officer that would bridge the gap that exists between the officers and black residents. That's why he joined. And his mom said it's, it's a punch in the gut. I mean, here you are. She says, you've raised this child, and you know who he is inside and out. He says, we're such a racially diverse family. And to be wrapped up in a racially motivated incident like this is just unfathomable. And it's broken his family apart. His two siblings have turned on their very own brother. Officer King's sister says she plans on changing her last name so that she'll never be associated with him again. She says, I don't care if it was his third day or not. He knows right from wrong. But he did right. Now, of course, we can talk about you know, things here and there and things that if you could do it again and all that stuff, right? But this was a man, George Floyd, who was high on fentanyl and meth. He, he admitted in the video, an officer early on, this is before there was any altercation, before the police, before they tried to get him in the police car or anything. And we played this clip before. The officer said, why are you foaming at the mouth? And George Floyd said, I, earlier I was hooping. Hooping is when you put drugs up your anus. So he was high on drugs. He committed a felony. Right, the, the counterfeit money, and then resisted arrest and was a danger to him and others. You have no idea what that's like to be in that scenario and how quickly something like that can get very dangerous for everyone involved. And all the activists, even his sister, they're thinking, I'm angry that this happened. Therefore, he's guilty. That's not how that works. For them, it's all emotion-driven to the point where it's causing family to even turn on their own brother. Hmm. So back to that ABC uh, anchor. Uh, she says it's about justice. This trial is about justice. See how crazy this is? Like, no, this trial is about, sorry, I was gonna say this trial is about justice for Eric Garner and Breonna Taylor and the countless black people who have been killed by police in this country. And it's like, no, 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 this trial is about Derek Chauvin, right? Like, that's all this trial's about. To say it's about the countless black people who have been killed by police this year, first of all, countless, it's 13. 13 unarmed black men killed a year. Sometimes it gets as high as 20. So that's very countable. Uh, also, unarmed doesn't mean not dangerous. Right? It's one thing to know as well, but it's not countless. 13. And of all the police shootings, right? So of all the people who police shoot, unarmed or not, every year, there was a poll done on liberals, and they said, liberals, how many, uh, or what percentage of the people that police shoot are black? What percentage of the people who police shoot are black? And liberals said it was about 60%. 60% of the people that police officers shoot are black every year. And it's 25. 25%. Which is, again, a very countable number. It's not countless. And then she brings up the backdrop of this case. And she brings up the stupid situation in New York City when this black guy told a white woman to put her dog on a leash and she felt threatened and called police and he was taping and uh, we have no idea what happened before the tape started and police showed up and everyone just went on their merry way. But the woman, I think the woman next to the guy was taping and put it online and it went viral. So police came back and, oh, well police did, the politicians came back and charged her with a crime. And then just a few weeks ago, they dropped the charges again Right, like how, like, and honestly, this is how good race relations are in America. That that is brought up as a, well, it's all within the backdrop of, of, of this incident. This incident. Here we got this uh, from Mayor De Blasio. He sent this tweet out. It's racism, plain and simple. This kind of hatred has no place in our city. 
Right? It's like, what are we, like, that's the place is this kind of hatred. Jeez, that's racism today? That's racism. And, and when uh, a police officer is on trial for murder, we're going to evoke these two knuckleheads from Central Park 2,000 miles away who both overreacted and both acted like fools? The ABC News anchor says that this is a, uh, Chauvin's knee is a symbol for black people around the globe? She went on and said Martin Luther King uh, III said if he's acquitted, the entire criminal justice system needs to be rethought. rethought. He said, she said, he said, can justice even ever be achieved for a black person? Man, it's that type of rhetoric that's going to cause cities to be burned to the ground if and when he's acquitted. We got to go, but a quick reminder of his defense. George Floyd has three to four to had three to four times the lethal amount of uh, fentanyl in his system. The autopsy said he did not die from asphyxiation or strangulation. The autopsy, the medical report said he did not have any damage done to his neck or any evidence of any uh, obstruction to his larynx, his ability to breathe. His lungs were two to three times the normal weight. That's called pulmonary edema. That's his lungs being filled with fluid that is caused by a drug overdose. And all of this was standard police training and protocol. And the police officers called for an ambulance twice. One time when he hit his head in the police car. That's not something police do when they're trying to kill a man. But none of that apparently matters. Derek Chauvin, I guess, has to pay for the sins of white people everywhere and white people around the globe. So the question is, will a jury look at the evidence? Or, or will they be swayed by thinking like that ABC News anchor and act like the nation's on trial? The true story is, the facts are on Derek Chauvin's side. The emotion and the rhetoric and the intimidation of violence is not. True story. Thanks later. Spread the word. Said, it's like I said, I'm reading here the Black Lives Matter 2020 Global Impact Report. It's a 42-page report uh, about how they've done and, and what's next. Mike Gonzalez is here, author of The Plot to Change America, How Identity Politics is Dividing the Land of the Free. Mr. Gonzalez, how are you, sir? How are you, Mike? I read that Man, report really good as well. to talk to you. I don't want to, I, before we get to that though, and I don't want to get you too off guard, but in the last segment we just played, uh, re related to the George Floyd murder trial, we just played a clip from the ABC News anchor who talked about how America's on trial and this is about black v. white and that neck symbolize the injustice against black people and can black people ever get justice if he's acquitted and like all these super sensational claims. What do we do with that? Like, is this trial, well, no. The defense clearly will try to make this a referendum on America. Is what happened with George Floyd a referendum on America? No, no, of course it's not. It's a, it's a horrific death that the poor man suffered. We all saw it. Uh, everybody who saw that, uh, that death was some, somehow damaged by it because we, we saw how, how he died. But it, it's not, this is not America. To, to pretend that this is America is a political project. It's a political project led by the Black Lives Matters organizations, first and foremost, and, and we get from its impact report how, uh, how well they used this horrific tragedy uh, in order to, to change America uh, a, a, along the lines that they would like to change it. I, as you know, because I have said this on your show before, the leaders of the Black Lives Matters organizations, nothing to do with the concept, the organizations are Marxists who don't like capitalism, don't like any aspect of capitalism, don't like the, our freedom to trade with each other, our freedom to, to, to be able to, to part with our property or to own property. And, uh, and, and they, they're using this tragedy to change America. That's the reason why I call my book to plot to change America, by the way. So that's a bold claim. Uh, how do you prove that? How do you prove that these are not just 
people, the activists. I'm not right. I'm not talking about the the person who right. is on Twitter and like tweets it out or whatever. But the activists, the people leading the organization. How do you prove that they're not just people who genuinely are against whatever bad things happening to black people, but they're more than that? Well, you and I are against bad things happening to black people and white people and everybody else. Uh, they, I, I don't have to prove it. They prove it. I quote them. By the way, you should know, and I'm breaking a little bit of news here, that I've just finished another book that the publishers are going to fast forward for publication in September, and it's on Black Lives Matter. Uh, the book is going to be on these organizations. Uh, these organizations are, they say this themselves. We don't, I quote them. They say that they don't, like Patrice Coulers, uh, uh, Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi do not like uh, uh, capitalism. They prefer uh, the, 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 the participatory democracy, quote unquote, that Venezuela practices, which is not a democracy at all uh, to, to, to our uh, representative system. They, they don't like many aspects of America. They, they say that the Constitution is illegitimate uh, because the Constitution stands in the way of the things they want to do. So, so I, I don't have, it's not me saying it, I quote them. So <clears throat> what's the connection between Black Lives Matter and, and against capitalism? Like, how are they going to use Black Lives Matter to fight against capitalism? Well, they say that capitalism is inherently racist. Uh, the, the Marxists have always had a problem, and they are Marxist. From, from Karl Marx on down, they've had a problem with private property, and not only with pro mm -hmm. alienated uh, private property, that means private property that you can sell, but also with alienated labor, labor that you can sell. Uh, they, they consider wage uh, to, to work for another man a continuation of slavery. That's why they call it wage mm -hmm. slavery. Uh, obviously, it's the opposite, right? It's working for another man for free that makes you a slave. If you get a wage, you're not a slave, and you choose to do it. Um, they will. They all say that it's not just them, right? It's, it's everybody who practices a, a, a critical race theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ibram X. Kennedy also says that he does not like capitalism, but capitalism is racist. Robin DiAngelo, also the, the, the writer of White Fragility, also says that capitalism produces bad outcomes and it is racist. Uh, it's not just them, but they, they, if we're talking about Black Lives Matter, yes, they all of them say it, not just the three, but all the top leaders are in agreement on this. And they're going to try to introduce, we saw in the impact report quite how how powerful they were in, 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 in organizing the protests, they boast having sent 127 million emails in 2020. And they say in that impact report that out of the 127 million emails they sent, 1.2 million actions were taken. Uh, these actions could be the, 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 the demonstrations that we saw, or it could be the 600 and some uh, riots that we saw as a result of the demonstrations. Could be the destruction of property. Um, so, so that impact report shows, and, and it shows also how political, how powerful their their uh, political action committee, their PAC is. They have a PAC. They have a curriculum. They have changed the country, and they have changed the country not for the better. They're changing the country for the worse. If 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 it means that we're going to get rid of our economic system, hmm. it's uh, it's impressive what they've been able to do so quickly. There's yes. no doubt about that. And to get the businesses, especially to fall in line and embrace what they're doing, which is so weird because you have capitalist businesses embracing this group that is uh, explicitly anti-capitalist. Would you say that's the, you know, the two of the three founders say they're Marxists, as you mentioned, but they say it, they're like, we're trained Marxists. Like, as you said, they, they don't hide this. Um, would you say that the anti-capitalism part is their main driving goal or one of them? Well, they, uh, by the way, not just uh, the two, but Opal Tometi also associates a long history of association uh, with Marxists. Uh, she, she, has, uh, she wrote a manifesto in support of, of, of the, 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 the socialist uh, revolution in Caracas. So she is also a Marxist herself. Yeah, maybe, you know what I was thinking? I, you know what I was thinking, Mike, as soon as I said that, I was like, it, no, it's two of the three, those three uh, identify as queer. That's actually what I meant. That's, that's, that's what it was. Two of the, they're all Marxists. Uh, right. Two of the three identify as queer, which then brings in like this other weird part of the Black Lives Matter platform as well, like the queer theory to it. Well, but they, anyway, well, back to the, your Yeah, on their, on their website, they used to say, now they have scrubbed their website as a result of the fact that I and people like me write about this. They, they said they wanted to, to problematize, I forget what language they used, the, the family, the patriarchal family. 
This is, again, this is Marxism 101. Marx and Engels, in the, in the manifesto in 48, 1848, when they create communism, they say, we must abolish the family. The family they see as, as, as the, 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 the foundation of the economic system they despise. They see the, the family as a, the foundation of private property. So that is the reason why they, they aim at the family and they want to get rid of the family. In the, in the case of the Black Lives Matter organizations, it is not because they are Marxist, it is not surprising that they, they, they say in the, uh, on the website, or they used to say very clearly, that they want to get, to get rid of the power of the family. The family is the center of our, of our civilization, as you know. Yeah, and it's so interesting from the Marxist perspective, it's the center of the cap, it's the foundation of capitalism as well. So you got to get rid of that if you want to get rid of capitalism. Wow, that's so interesting. Uh, I have a last question for you, Mike. Um, what do we? What would one say to their friend or their family member who's like, yeah, Black Lives Matter, of course, because you can't really come at them and be like, oh, these are a bunch of a queer critical race theory Marxists, right? Like people are like, I don't even know what those words mean. What are you talking about? So how do you talk to the normal person who's falling for it? Well, and of course, I, like every other American, I have many family mem members, close family members, who are quite shaken by that, that video and wanted to take part in the protests. So I have had that discussion. And I have said, look, don't be a pawn in, in, in somebody else's project. They, what they want to do is, is really destabilize society. They say that America is st structurally, systemically, and institutionally uh, racist because they want to change all the structures the institutions and the system. Uh, so there are other ways to express your outrage. There are other ways to express our love for all our compatriots, black and white alike, or whatever whatever color or whatever sexual orientation. You don't have to become a pawn in a project by organizations that very clearly want to change America. Mm, There's other ways to do it. I like that. The plot to change America, how identity politics is dividing the land of the free. And obviously, Mike, let's talk about when your new book comes out soon. But we'll talk before then. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Appreciate you. Coming up next, you know, yesterday we talked about DAs, these rogue DAs, George Soros-backed DAs. Uh, and we were talking kind of big picture. Coming up next, we're going to talk about someone who is a direct victim of these rogue DAs policies. It's next. True story. Mike Slater. Spread the word. Crusaders. I think this is one of the most important stories that uh, no one's talking about. Rogue DAs. So, quick background. A DA is, usually, it's elected, elected position. They prosecute crimes. Now, DAs have a ton of discretion. Lawmakers pass laws, and they say these things are illegal. But at the end of the day, the DA only has so many lawyers, so much time, so much money to prosecute. They can't prosecute everything. So there's a bit of prosecutorial discretion. They're like, well... Let's put more emphasis on this crime, or let's put a little less emphasis, therefore, on this other crime over here. And they're working with the police departments to figure out where they need to be prosecuting more or where they can prosecute less. Right? George Soros, a couple years back, maybe 10 years ago, decided, why are we spending so much money trying to elect these congressmen who can only do so much? No one pays attention to DA's races. It doesn't take a lot of money to elect these DA's. And we could put some crazy progressive criminal justice reform activists in these DA roles that have wild amounts of discretion to, well, in this progressive case, not prosecute any of these crimes. So yesterday we talked a bit about this on a, on a big picture level, like a philosophical level, and I wanna talk about it on a very specific level. Uh, two years ago, three years ago, there was a man, 21-year-old man in, in LA who was uh, murdered. Uh, the suspects uh, beat and stabbed this man for several minutes until he lost consciousness. They drove him to a mountain to try to throw him over the cliff. Uh, along the way, they realized he was still alive. They stomped on his head. They threw him over the cliff. They still heard him struggling. And one of the suspects went down and uh, to attack him some more. So what happened with the suspects? The mom of Echo, that 21-year-old man is here, Desiree Andrade. Desiree, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me, can, by the I, way. 
Am I, are you kidding me? I can't even begin to imagine. And thank you for like for just talking about it, for reliving it, and I'm, I'm so grateful because I want to make sure this never happens again. Can you tell us a little bit about your son first? Um, so my son was 20 years old um, when this occurred. Um, he was uh, kidnapped from my my parents' home uh, by friends, supposed friends, and um, taken to a room in a house and brutally beaten. Um, he was um, unconscious, and they took him up to the Azusa Canyons, which is a canyon near my, it, where he lived, my parents' home, and they dumped his body on the side of the road. Prior to that, though, um, as they were driving him up this canyon, my son must have moved his leg and showed some type of life, so when they got up to the canyon, these gentlemen pulled him out and um, they beat him up some more. And when they realized that, okay, he's now probably dead, they threw him off the cliff and going down the cliff, apparently my son made some type of noise, which showed them that he was still alive. So one of them went down and um, proceeded to stomp on his head some more. This was all uh, blunt force trauma to my son's head. Um, so. I'm right now trying to fight for justice for my son with this whole Gascon radical policies that he has going on right now in Los Angeles County. That makes no, absolutely no sense, especially well, let's, with let's something that's going so on right now. Yeah, and thank you again, Desiree, for sharing this. So the DA, Gascon, just elected. He used to be the DA up in San Francisco for like eight years, and they brought him down to LA for some reason, George Zoros funded. Mm -hmm. um, what did he decide to prosecute? How did he decide to prosecute the, the suspects? Uh, so prior to Gascon taking office, these suspects were facing life without parole and um, the death penalty. Uh, since Soros, um, I'm sorry, since Gascon came into office, he decided to take that off the table. These gentlemen are now facing 25 years um, without parole. I'm sorry, with parole. And, um, and so these guys would be out in less than 20 years and around 40 years old, which just makes no sense. I mean, these guys will be out to live a full life where my son was cheated from that. What's his ideological justification for this, right? What, what, what's motivating Gascon to lessen a sentence that much? Well, he says money. I mean, he's saving taxpayer money by keeping uh. people less time in jail, which is Ridiculous! How are you putting monetary value to this on somebody's life? Yep. Um, you know, he also says that statistics show that the brain doesn't fully develop um, until they're 25 years old. That also doesn't make any sense. You're if so, somebody commits a murder, they knew exactly what they were doing. They weren't stealing a lollipop. You know, so his 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 justification to what he's doing makes absolutely no sense, and it's a slap in the face to us victims because. We're the ones living this. He's not. The cost thing is such, it's such BS. Because um, as you said, you can't put a cost on your son's life, but also on the victims that are to come uh, when they're released from prison. Uh, the, you can't put a money value on that. Um, he says this, I'm sure they says this is for justice, right? Uh, it's uh, restorative justice. It's reforming the justice system, Desiree. Hmm. And that's what makes me laugh because who is this justice for? Honestly, he is a district attorney and he should be fighting for us victims and, and the justice should be for us and we should feel safe. But right now, I truly feel that he's acting like a, a defense attorney and the justice is for the criminals right now. It's criminals over victims. I mean, to put it, to give you an idea of what's going on, he held a, in a, a virtual meeting for defense attorneys and his own department was not allowed to, to attend this meeting. How does that make any sense? He hires a defense attorney now for a district to be a district attorney who has never done this before. She's been a dis defense attorney. I honestly yeah, feel right. that he's he he. I don't I don't know. I honestly feel he's in no. the wrong office. Yeah, he should be a defense attorney. Sure. Yeah. What about the suspects? Um, are they apologetic for what they did? Oh, absolutely not. In fact, um, in December, when we went in uh, to to fight for the these um, enhancements, these special circumstances that ju that Gascon wants to take down, which is special circumstance of kidnapping, lion weight, and and robbery, 
Um, and I went in and I pled to the judge to please not take those away because that's what's giving this 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 um, case in in my eyes justice. And so she dismissed them. Okay, and in front of me, these the defense attorney and one of the guys, the defendants, um, defense attorney gives them a fist bump, like good job really in front of my face who I I'm the mother and you disrespected me by celebrating in that courtroom every time they come in and they walk in there's no sign of remorse on their face they look at me with these eyes like really this is a waste of my time being here mm. uh you know Desiree, putting I, their heads back Desiree. and annoyed I, I hate I have to cut you off. I, I hope we can talk again. I am so grateful, and we are going to do everything we can on this show and on my local show in San Diego to uh, get rid of Gascon so that you uh, get justice and many other families do as well. Um, Thank, you. You, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so family. much for having me. I appreciate it. You're, you're very welcome. Rogue DAs, woke DAs. It's a massive problem, and George Soros knows that it's a vulnerability in our country. That's why he's exploited it. True story. Mike Slater. Spread the word.